Dean and Head of Campus, uh, to welcome you this evening to the University of Otago Christchurch. Uh, my name is Professor Suzanne Pitama, and I get to welcome you on this very cold night into what I hope is a little bit warmer of a lecture theatre. Um, the waiata that I began my, the evening with is one that many of you may be familiar with. It was written by Hirani, um Melbourne, and it's about the, kahi, the kahikatea tree. And what I love about the kahikatea tree is that as it grows, it has really, really shallow roots. And so they grow in groves so that their roots intertwine and strengthen each other so that the only way that they can survive as trees is to be clustered together and to be intertwined. And um, I think that's really relevant to our discussion this evening about rangatahi haura. Uh, youth health and the importance of us as a village uh, working and supporting and um, strengthening our rangatahi so that they can really flourish in the environment that we are creating for them and that they have aspirations for themselves. And I'm a little bit biased to say that out of the three public health lectures we're presenting, this may be my favourite. And not just because these people are amazing, but also as a child psychologist, I think I have a personal bias, so I'm just going to declare that now. Uh, so once again, just on behalf of our team, welcome. It's amazing to have you alongside us this evening. We promise that it'll be fun, entertaining, educating, no pressure. Um, and I, uh, my husband's here tonight, and he'll tell you that my dream as a 15-year-old was to be on the Oprah show, but I am guessing this is the closest I'm ever going to get, so I'm, I'm living that moment up. So uh, welcome, and it's with great pleasure that I'll now introduce you to our MC for this evening, the wonderful Laurelie Mason. Kia ora, Laurelie. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks very much, Suze. Beautiful singing again. Uh, I'm the Communications Advisor here at the University of Otago um, Christchurch and um, welcome everybody to what I hope is going to be a wonderful night, as Sue said, a bit of fun, a bit of uh, um, information, something to set us all on our way as parents and grandparents. Um, of course, this is the third of our fourth public talks to celebrate Kia Mau, the University of Otago Christchurch's 50th anniversary. And we're here to celebrate our clinical, academic and research expertise. Koti ahure o e tamaiti arahia o toto mahi. Let the uniqueness of the child guide our work. I'm sure that's the case for all our experts here and what they do every day. Um, but also here as parents, we all know our children are all different, very much so. Um, and I know that more than most. I've got five, uh, three of my own two stepchildren, uh, and a lovely blended family. Um, as I've always said right from the beginning, there's nothing more, one thing about uh, child rearing, it's unrelenting in its relentlessness every single day. Um, and another saying, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. That's something uh, I've always lived by, really. And I think a lot of you might understand that um, with children, whether they be happy one minute, anxious the next, um, upset, disappointed, thrilled. You go through the whole gamut of emotions with them. So we've got four wonderful experts here tonight who are going to talk about a wonderful array of parenting issues some of you may be facing, uh, or if you're educators, uh, may well be in your teaching environment as well. From vaping to fad diet to more serious issues with diet in terms of eating disorders, uh, a teen's mental health, social media, uh, sleep, issues like that, which are part of every day uh, having a teen. We'll hear f uh, firstly from Professor Tony Walls, Associate Professor Jenny Jordan, Associate uh, Professor Philip Pattermore, 
Professor Richard Porter and Dr. Jenny Manuel. Um, after their presentations, if we, depending on how much time we have left, we'll have a quick Q&A session where you can fire a couple of questions at the experts. Um, if we run out of time, they will be hanging around for a few minutes afterwards if you want to pop down and say hello. Okay, let's begin. Well, Tony Walls, Professor Tony Walls is the head of the campus's Department of Paediatrics and a consultant paediatrician at Tufata Aura Canterbury, specialising in infectious diseases. His research interests include the epidemiology of childhood infections, bone and joint infections in children, as well as childhood vaccinations to prevent serious disease. Tony's an advisor to Pharmac and the Health Ministry on Childhood Vaccine Matters and is convener of the fifth year medical school teaching program here on campus, here in paediatrics. He's also co-director of the recently established Research for Children Aotearoa group, which has brought expert researchers together from across the motu to enhance uh, child research. And Tony will now very briefly, just to start us off as a short introduction to the evening, tell us what our Research for Children Aotearoa is all about. Thanks very much, Laurelie, and good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see the crowd here on a cold project. Fantastic. Um, so as a paediatrician, I guess the first thing I have to say is that I don't know any more than most people about uh, teenagers. Uh, so I'm, I'll be relying on these guys, the experts. I'm going to talk mostly about our research program as I'm kind of representing uh, the paediatric department of research that we do. And I really wanted to just, I'll be very brief, but I want to talk about research for children in Aotearoa. Almost a year ago to the day, we had some beautiful singing in this very lecture theatre with Professor Pitama in, included, uh, starting the journey of our research collaborative, Research for Children Aotearoa. Uh, we've had some great support across the university and across the community, and uh, this is a collaborative that brings together not just our university, but other institutions across Canterbury and across the rest of the country that are interested and dedicated to children's health and wellbeing research. If you're all teched up, you can go to our website. You guys will remember COVID where you just had to scan in. So if you want to get your phones and have a look, you can see some stories about the research that we've been doing. We're committed to a, a lot of different things, including promoting uh, Pacific and Māori young researchers coming through. Our, our latest appointment in the department is a, a young Māori woman who's returning to New Zealand in a year or so uh, to set up her research. We've had, the last two years, we've had young Pacifica researchers who are doing projects as they go through med school, uh, and hopefully we're setting the scene for developing some really talented researchers to come through. The other thing I just wanted to briefly touch on is uh, the, the youth hub. Some of you may be aware that this is being built in Christchurch at the moment, uh, just off on Salisbury Street, and Dame Sue Bagshaw, who's a member of our department, is one of the key people in setting all this up. It's, it's an absolutely fabula fabulous looking facility. It's going to bring together youth in, in Canterbury and, and many of the different agencies, instead of reaching out to them, will be able to come to where the young people are. Uh, it has a number of different um, uh, aspects to it. There's going to be a limited amount of short-term accommodation for young people who are just getting off the ground, getting their feet together, getting things sorted. There's going to be representatives from education, from lots of different agencies that support youth in the community. And we had a hui last week involving Sue and her team and our team looking at how we can embed a research program for development into the youth hub uh, and work together with all the agencies that are working with our youth uh, to figure out what's going to be best from their perspective and from our perspective about developing research in children. So I'm going to pass it on to my colleagues soon, but I just thought I would chuck up a quote first for you guys to have a think about. And have a quick read. It sounds a bit old, and I was wondering if anyone could tell me when or who that might have been from. I'll give you a minute or so. Up the back there. It is Socrates. So we want to be positive, and from an adult perspective, I think we could say we've been misunderstanding teenagers for more than two and a half thousand years, and it's about time we got it right. So I'm going to hand back to Laurelie now. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much, Tony. That's wonderful. Associate Professor Jenny Jordan is going to speak uh, now. Now, Jenny's a busy clinical psychologist and has been an investigator and therapist in a series of randomised clinical trials 
evaluating different therapies for serious mental disorders, including eating disorders, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder related to the Christchurch quakes. She was part of the research team that developed specialist supportive clinical management for anorexia nervosa. Now, Jenny's current research focuses um, very much, she's a co-lead investigator in the New Zealand arm of the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative, EDGI, it's called. Now, it's the largest genetic investigation of eating disorders ever performed worldwide. This is a large and very major trial, and its results will be groundbreaking for clinicians, parents, and teens struggling with the very real and debilitating issues that eating disorders cause. Jenny. So, um before we talk about eating disorders, we need to acknowledge there's a spectrum from normal eating to disordered eating through to uh, the more famous eating disorders of anorexia nervosa, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. And I think most people will know about the characteristics of those. So I'm going to focus on the ones maybe you don't know about, which uh, the first one is bigorexia. It's an interesting name. And this is not actually even an eating disorder. It's a um, body dysmorphic disorder, and it affects young men who... Uh, perceive themselves as way too thin and that they need to bulk up. And so they're often um, uh, doing bodybuilding, using uh, protein supplements, and they're actually at risk later on of using um, anabolic steroids and getting into all sorts of unhelpful eating behaviours. Um, the other ones are um, ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This is something that normally occurs in infancy, and some of you may have had fussy eaters um, as toddlers. Um, for many people, that's a, a condition they grow out of, but for some, it's very severe. It can become very restrictive in eating, and they can have uh, major physical consequences. But it can occur at other ages, too. It can occur in, um, throughout the lifespan, and, but it's not driven by fear of weight, um, of being too fat. It's driven by uh, fear of uh, sensory characteristics of food or fear of um, maybe vomiting afterwards or actually just not having an appetite. And orthorexia has been in the news lately that's uh, where people start focusing on healthy eating, take it to clean eating, uh, and then they start dropping food groups and it becomes very unhealthy indeed and can be fatal. So who gets an eating disorder? Short answer, anyone can get an eating disorder. The stereotype is young, female, um, and certainly they're the people who turn up for treatment. But uh, it's most important to realise that males get it as well, and gender diverse and ethnic, um, non binary sexual orientation. Um, young people have much higher rates of eating disorders. Uh, and minorities, uh, ethnic minorities uh, in New Zealand, Māori and Pacific Island, have at least as high and perhaps even higher rates of eating disorders, but it's under recognised. Um, so why should we worry about fad diets? Uh, you can see a lot on the right here. Some of you may recognise them, may have even indulged in them at times. <laughs> uh, so they always promise quick weight loss, don't they? Um, and, but they're always extreme, restrictive, uh, unbalanced and unsustainable. They don't have a scientific basis. There's no scientific basis for the grapefruit diet, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and actually, most importantly, they can be dangerous. Uh, the good news is most people can't stick to diets. Um, in fact, it's a very profitable industry, but um, uh, the Fair Trading Act should come into account there, really, because greater than 95% of people will not be able to sustain diets. Uh, and the bad news is if you do yo-yo dieting over your lifetime, you end up putting on weight. Uh, but most important in this context, it can signal an emerging eating disorder. The other risk factors for eating disorders in young people are these kind of activities. Now, they're great activities, but uh, they have risks as well. So there are many activities in that first group, like dancing and gymnastics and so on, that have a really high focus on appearance, uh, a certain look. Um, the clothing is always quite um, figure-revealing, uh, and there's lots of mirrors and things like that too. So. Uh, the scrutiny that people come under is quite high and affects their body image. And so the ones at the bottom tend to have uh, weight categories, so people have to stay within a certain weight, and often uh, people engage in really unhealthy weight control behaviours to stay within their team. Uh, this example is uh, a really good example of the kind of imagery that young people are exposed to. It's a wash with imagery like this that promotes a thin ideal 
that promotes, they call it thin spro and uh, fit spro, inspiration to lose weight and to get fit. And young people gravitate to websites listed at the bottom here, the ones that have been noted in research that have a really high proportion of appearance focused websites. Facebook's a lot more diverse, but it has some sites in there that are a bit toxic. And this is how it affects young people. So what we have at the top is really high exposure to this appearance-focused uh, content. And people, uh, young people will look at that and internalise that thin Western ideal of what, what beauty looks like or what, um, what is attractive. And then they engage with those sites. So the sites encourage them to engage by posting comments, posting selfies, and uh, what happens is as people do that, they start to uh, get consequences of that, mental health consequences. So first of all, they do, it's exacerbated by this um, really toxic cognitive process called comparison. So they do upward comparisons. So they look at images and think, I'm not as pretty, I'm not as, um, rich, I'm, I don't have an interesting life like that person, I'm not good enough. Uh, and then they, that leads them to develop appearance contingent self-worth. So they have to look good or they don't feel good. And there's really good evidence that staring at those sites, being, gravitating on those sites leads to negative feelings uh, every time they do it, body dissatisfaction and low self-esteem. And because they're feeling so bad, they follow the advice on those sites and try to make themselves better by dieting and engaging in things like excessive exercise. And so that's how it circulates. And then it's made worse by the social media algorithms, which, of course, whatever you look at gets fed back to you. And so it goes. Um, so what can we do about it? It's all a bit depressing, but actually uh, the good news is there's some really good prevention programs coming on. They don't have very strong effects, but they do have effects for people who are at risk. Um, so they are called media literacy programs. So they teach people how to dissect the content that's on there and with a, a more scrutiny. Um, so they do reality checks. They'll show them photos of this one here that's been photoshopped, you can see. But there's also use of filters. Um, and of course, it's all curated. Like most of us don't post our ugly photos online. We only put the best ones up, right? Um, and it's, it's like maximized on YouTube and all of those sites. They teach dissonance, they, they teach people to challenge that ideal of the thin ideal, why should the all of the world look like thin Western um, images, um, and promote counter views on what, how we should value ourselves, that's not about appearance. Uh, so it's about teaching resilient coping. And they also talk about um, educating people on how those sites work. Uh, you know, what's, what's in it for the influencers? Of course they want the attention, but they're usually peddling some product at the same time. And the social media companies make money out of this. So that's quite an important factor. So what can you do as parents? Um, one really important thing is promoting body acceptance. So for ourselves, for our kids, uh, for our pets, um, eat family meals together. There's lots of good reasons to do that, that are about communication and so on, uh, but also keeping an eye on what they're eating or not eating, um, and just being interested in their lives. And I think having these really good open conversations about the internet, I see China's trying to limit it to two hours per night for a kid. That don't work, won't work here, will it? But actually discussing what it's like, what they go to, what they see, and how to perhaps limit use to leave time for getting involved with real life, not just your internet friends. Um, how to avoid toxic sites. If it makes them feel bad, leave it alone. Um, and having this intentional focus on going to good sites. There's heaps of great stuff on the internet that will make people feel good, that will build um, self-esteem. So, and most of all, encouraging a healthy skepticism. And so in that light, I've just found a favorite site of the week, lifefaker.com. So we could all go there and do this. Instead of going through the hassle of living a perfect life, you can just get the photos. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jenny. Well, um, now time for uh, Philip Patamore. So, uh, Philip's recently retired as Associate Professor of Paediatrics at the University of Otago Christchurch here, and also as a Paediatric Respiratory and General Specialist at Te Whata Ora Christchurch Hospital. His research interests are in childhood asthma epidemiology, the effects of tobacco smoking and vaping on children and young people, 
and the clinical pathology of cystic fibrosis. He's currently engaged uh, in a high school vaping study, uh, looking at the impact on students of an educational video about vaping, examining student attitudes and expressed intentions towards it, and the emerging results from that study um, are very interesting, and um, Phil will perhaps be able to share a little bit of how that's going so far. He's been an advocate and lobbyist for tobacco control and smoke-free issues on behalf of the Paediatric Society of New Zealand and also Doctors for Healthy Trade. Philip. Tēnā katoa, katoa. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can't hear you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Getting older, isn't it? Oh. Next. So I'm going to talk about e-cigarettes. A lot of smoke and hot air um, breathed about e-cigarettes and um, they were first patented in 1963. The first person to invent them invented them to try and help people give up smoking. And that's how they snuck under the radar into New Zealand originally to help people smoke smoking. But of course now with a commercial market, they're marketed as a recreation product in a bewildering variety of devices, colours, and e-liquids, flavours. They're marketed with or without nicotine, and some of the nicotine content in some e-cigarette liquids is uh, way, way higher than that of cigarettes. And e-cigarettes have really risen in an age where smoking amongst year 10 students, this is ASH year 10 data since 1999, has fallen down to um, very, very low levels. Headmasters were saying there's very few students smoking, but vaping has become a problem and has replaced it. And you can see the figures for vaping there. So this is regular smoking and regular vaping. So what is the harm? Well, the coil in an e-cigarette is a metal coil, and as it heats the liquid, some heavy metal, chrome and other, chromium and other heavy metals um, are leaked into the liquid. And we know these are in trace amounts but you would get exposed to heavy metals repeatedly again and again and again for long periods of time. We know they and they have harmful effects on cells, some carc carcinogenic potential. There are agents, including the base liquid, can cause inflammation in the airways, and that can make children cough. There's a large study in Korea showing that it was, vaping was associated with a significant increase in coughing and also in worsening asthma. So airway effects from inflammatory agents. And there's a lot of, a lot of those flavorings got into e-cigarettes because they were approved by the FDA as um, flavors for food. Now, that may seem logical to, <laughs> it doesn't quite to me as a respiratory physician, if you think of a peanut in your stomach and a peanut in your airways, it's two very different things. Your airways are not designed to have foreign substances breathed into them and they react quite violently to oils and, and a number of the flavorings that are used in um, e-cigarettes. They are probably less harmful than tobacco. How much less harmful is way up for debate. Um, Public Health England estimated based basically on a show of hands among so-called experts was 5% as a um, New Zealand study estimated 30% as harmful as cigarettes. And somewhere in there, we don't know the long-term um, toxicity of this. But they are certainly not harmless. So if a smoker is sw seeking to switch to vaping, they're seeking to reduce the harms, and that's the whole basis of the so-called 
harm reduction approach to quitting smoking. And those people who deal with adult smokers uh, swear by e-cigarettes and say they're getting people off smoking. But if you're a non-smoker taking up vaping, you are adding to your risks and you're gaining new risks that you didn't have before. So there is one risk that we know quite a bit about because it was in cigarettes, and that is nicotine itself. Now nicotine is in e-cigarettes, it's also in so-called heat, not burn devices and uh, e-cigarettes. And nicotine is a very, very addictive substance. It's one of the most addictive substances known. And it leads to addictive behavior if you miss, if you are addicted to it and you miss your smokes. And that's what headmasters up and down the country do complain about people leaving the classroom because they have to get their next date because they're so heavily addicted and they can't keep still and they're disrupting the class. And if you're addicted to nicotine and you're using nicotine product again and again and again over months and years, you're gonna get repeated exposure to whatever else goes on in the, alongside the nicotine, which is those heavy metals, those inflammatory things. And so repeated and cumulative exposure goes along with addiction to other addictions. So nicotine turns on something in the brain, the reward center, which seems in many studies to promote um, proneness to other addictions, including alcohol and other drugs. And it affects mood and concentration and judgment, particularly in the developing brain, we understand. There's another factor, and that is behind nicotine is big tobacco. Now, most of the nicotine and e-cigarettes come from the tobacco industry. There are a few uh, initial companies that started with synthetic nicotine. Most of it comes from tobacco farming. And the tobacco industry has gotten wholly on board with the e-cigarette phenomenon. They've supported it. They've even supported the idea of harm reduction, uh, tobacco, a smoke-free world. There's an organization in Europe by Philip Morris, make Marlboro cigarettes for a smoke-free world. But they're still making cigarettes. In fact, they're increasing their production of cigarettes. And they love e-cigarettes. Why? Because nicotine is keeping people addicted to nicotine. And that just favors all their products. And they have been deceptive and irresponsible, socially irresponsible. They work for a profit motive, not a health motive. And this huge social and economic cost of tobacco farming, which you never hear about, but the World Health Organization, the United Nations, have been talking about these for years. So what is being done? Well, there is legislation um, on the books for regulations on, on sale and marketing of e-cigarettes. So new vape shops will be unable to open up near schools that doesn't stop the existing vape shops in your schools. Generic flavor descriptions, uh, maximum nicotine strength to try and discourage the use of single use of disposable vapes and requirement for removable batteries and child safety mechanisms. But the government, many of us feel, could be doing a lot more, restricting vaping sales to specialist vape shops or pharmacies with compulsory training in vaping and quitting, banning disposable vapes altogether, removing all but a few basic flavors. These things seem obvious to some of us, and compulsory education in schools about vaping. What can parents or concerned young people do? The first thing is to listen and keep communication all open. So, Listen to each other, listen to parents, listen to teenagers, and teenagers listen to parents. Um, there's no point in starting World War III over this. Many young people who vape are aware of the unwanted effects, and many of them admit that they're addicted. They don't want people hammering this again over their heads. They were told this was a safe product when they tried it, they were curious. So be kind. <coughs> 
and be open about the potential risks, but use felt-tipped hammers if you're going to hammer a point home. <laughs> Don't overstate the risk. There are worse things, believe it or not, a teenager could do. They could start World War III. <laughs> and quitting vaping is essentially about quitting nicotine addic addiction. So far, we don't have any specialist vape quitting services, but quitting is just like quitting smoking. Uh, talk to your GP and your practice nurse, smoking cessation services, quit line, and nicotine replacement therapy. They need lots of follow-up encouragement, and don't give up on them. Don't give up on yourself. Keep those lines of communication open and be kind. So e-cigarettes seem to be on the direction to both smoking and smoke-free, and it's made for a lot of confu confusion. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. I wonder if you turned that off, or is it still going? Got a quick question. Your, yeah. um, the study you're doing in the schools, so Philip's um, got a PhD student he's supervising doing a study in schools on vaping. What are some of the early results that young ones are telling you? Um, we're hearing a lot about um, young people who, who want to stop vaping. We're hearing a lot about um, people who, who feel addicted and that they can't control it and they, they know it and they want to actually come off. We, we have had a, a little pilot study that told us most teenagers were not getting vapes from vape shops. They were actually getting them from friends and family, um, which uh, means that regulations about vape shops on their own are not necessarily going to stop young people getting hold of vapes. But actually, a lot of young people are crying out for help, and they're not getting it from the government, interestingly enough. The government does not seem, so far, as far as I can see, to be listening to the young people's cries for help on this matter. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you, Philip. Um, and I think, too, you know, Australia, uh, not so long ago, have uh, changed the legislation, haven't they, to, uh, you've got to go to a GP if you're, um, to get a vaping prescription, for if you, you've got to be older as well, um, and none for under 18s. It's something that perhaps, uh, interesting, with an election coming up, none of our parties have uh, so far got into this. Okay, well, we're going to step now onto sleep and those sorts of issues and hear from Professor Richard Porter. Richard's the head of the campus's Department of Psychological Medicine. Am I on mute? I'm on mute. Sorry, that's it. You're right. I'm back again. Richard Porter. Richard's the head of the campus's Department of Psychological Medicine, as well as being um, the director of the Mental Health Clinical Research Unit. He's more than 200 published papers to his name. His main research interests are in the treatment of mood disorders, trials looking at proposed treatments for the likes of depression, anxiety, bipolar, as well as ECT therapy and its use. He's conducted multiple studies into the neurobiology of mood disorders and cognitive impairment, <coughs> excuse me, and is now conducting studies on cognitive remediation in mood disorders. He's a consultant psychiatrist specialising in the care of adults with intellectual disability, and he also sees patients with treatment-resistant mood disorders. Richard. Tene koto katoa. Thank you, Laurelie, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening. Could I start with a quick poll? How many of you have teenagers in your homes at the moment? So many. How many of you have had the experience of getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to the loo, and you see a little chink of light or glow coming under the door? So quite a lot. How many of you don't let your teenagers have their phones in their rooms at, at night? Great. And of course, you all realize that the biology of the body is set on a 24-hour rhythm because that's how, how the world works. And it's really important. And it's not just sleep that works on a 24-hour rhythm. You see multiple things uh, uh, work on that sort of rhythm. At the moment, you have your highest blood pressure in the day, uh, Jenny and um, Phil have tried to soothe you a little bit, but it's, it is the fact that your blood pressure is likely to be highest. If you want to beat your teenager at table tennis, 
wait till they have woken up at 1 p.m. and play them at 2.30 when your, your coordination reflexes are best. Um, melatonin is the hormone that's most important in this system, and it begins to be secreted around about 9 or 10 o'clock at night and rises during the night and then settles in the morning. And what, what sets this circadian rhythm? Well, it's light. Pretty much that is the most important thing. And we see, so I'm being blinded now by this screen in front of me, that's white light. And it's a combination of all the colors of light in the visible spectrum. But the light that is most important is blue light. That is what entrains the body's circadian rhythm. And there's only one other thing that you can alter to do with circadian rhythm, and that is having a regular social routine. And so what you do at regular times each day actually also helps to entrain your rhythm. So breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, whatever you do on a regular basis. And if you don't do activities on any sort of regular basis, that's losing the opportunity to entrain your circadian rhythm. And it works very simply. Blue light comes into the eye, hits the retina, goes through a couple of parts of the brain to signal, and blue light very effectively suppresses the secretion of melatonin. So if you're exposed to blue light in the evening and at night, your melatonin's switched off. But when you're exposed to light in the morning, you go out, you go out in the sun, sunlight, immediately that's suppressing the melatonin so that it's accentuating your circadian rhythm. No melatonin during the day, a good secretion during the night. And that works well in most circumstances. But it, the world isn't perfect. And here we've got Trumza in northern Norway, midday in the middle of winter, and it's dark. And we've got a satellite shot of the US in the middle of the night. And you can see the main cities on the east coast here. You can see Los Angeles. You can see Donald Trump's legal office here. Um, so, you know, that it's not ideal. You get to countries where there is a very little sunlight in the winter and a whole lot in the summer. And we have this issue with artificial light. And, of course, the problem that you all know about, the problem of excessive screen time. And this is Buddy um, editing my slides for me. And so a screen like this is emitting large amounts of blue light at exactly the wrong time of the day if your teens are using their screens in the evening, uh, their cell phones, their, their computers, television screens are emitting large amounts of blue light, potentially turning off melatonin secretion. And is that a problem? Well, I don't want to overstate this. You know, you've all got teens who are going to bed at 2 o'clock and then waking up at 1 o'clock the next day, and most of them will be all right. But phase delay and sleep loss are, on average, associated with problems with mental health. And by phase delay, I mean going to bed very late and then waking up very late. So your phase is not uh, entrained to the normal daylight hours. And of course, if you're going to bed very late and you're sleeping very late, you can't get to sleep, and you're living in a, the society we live in, you've got to get up the next morning to go to school. And essentially, what you've got is equivalent to jet lag. Your, your body is not set on the rhythm of what you actually have to do in the country you're living in. And that is associated, both those situations, again, I don't want to worry you, but it is associated with conditions like depression, like low mood. And we see this cycle, this vicious cycle of um, having some sort of sleep problem or, or phase delay, and it may be due to do with stress, it may be to do with uh, screen use, and then mood lowering. And of course, someone with low mood doesn't cope as well. So perhaps at school they withdraw a bit. They don't engage so much with their friends or they're a bit irritable. And that then can lead to interpersonal stresses, difficulties in their peer relationships, which are difficult anyway for teenagers and stressful. And that then leads to further sleep loss because they lie awake worrying about it or being even more active on social media in the night because they can't bear the thought that everyone else is communicating and they're not. 
And so that can lead to this vicious cycle. So to get a little bit more positive, what can we do about it? And what can we reasonably do it about it? And I echo um, Phil's point that you, you can't just go in and just you know, tell your team what to do. I've tried it and it never worked for me. So some real common sense things. So try to have something like a regular wake time. Now in school time, it's, it's going to be set. But maybe try and have it on a Saturday as well so that it keeps going for at least six-sevenths of the week. And in the holidays, well, maybe 10 o'clock on most days within half an hour rather than 2 o'clock. Um, and try to keep that as regular as you can. Some sort of routine that involves morning light. You know, the best thing is morning light. So Saturday morning sport is a great way to keep that going at the weekends. Walking to school, of course. But even if in the holidays you just set some ta a table up on the patio and the breakfast's out there, that's better than nothing. Have an anchor point in the day, so set the social rhythms at least once in the day. There's some sort of family activity. Maybe it's tea time. Maybe you work shifts and it's really difficult. But think of something that you can do with your kid at a set time, with your kids at a set time each day. Have that discussion about screen use in the evening in particular. And try to come up with a time where the last screen use is. You know, my daughter, all she always had... She was doing an assignment, she was late, it had to be in by midnight. She couldn't do it off the computer because it was all on the computer. So there was always a reason why it had to go on beyond nine o'clock. But, you know, do your, do your best. And a very simple thing you can do is put blue blocking filters on screens. I'm not going to tell you how because you just ask your teenager. They, they all know how to do this. Google it. It's the first thing that comes up. Very easy thing to do blue blocking on screen. So, um, very simple tip. We take this in mental health, we take this really quite seriously because in more severe mood disorders it is a, an important factor. And this is St. Olaf's Psychiatric Hospital in Trondheim in northern Norway. And they've built one wing of the hospital actually becomes blue blocked between 6 and 6.30 each night and then it it's, that reverses in the morning. And this is what it looks like. So the blinds have come down blue blocked, the lights are blue blocked. Any electricians in the audience? I was thinking you could wire your kids' rooms up to do this, but there is a, there is a simpler way of doing this, and that is to wear these. So this is, this is blue blocking glasses. So now I, I can see you, but there is no blue light entering my retina, but I can still see and I can still interact. Um, perhaps not the trendiest thing, and your, <laughs> your kids may not want to wear this on a first date at, at Rollican, which is where they all go, I'm told, for first dates these days. Um, but, you know, the concept of, of orange-tinted glasses is not new, and so there are some role models here. There's Lord. Do you know who this is? You need to get with your kids a, a little bit. <laughs> it's Loyal Karner, who's a, a rapper. And, but do reassure your kids that it's, if they wear orange glasses, their hair and eyebrows don't necessarily turn the same color. So I'm sure you were worried about Buddy, but don't worry, we've come up with a solution for that. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. You never know, they might take on, uh, take off. Other uh, These teens, they might like those. You never know, maybe in their Christmas um, packages. Um, now we're going to have a, a listen to Dr. Jenny Manuel. Jenny's a senior lecturer in the, in the Department of Māori Indigenous Health Innovation, or MIHI here, and also the Department of Psychological Medicine. So she has postgrad teaching responsibilities in both departments, with subject areas including haora Māori, the nature and extent of mental disorders, and mental health nursing. She has an active supervisory role with masters and PhD students here on campus as well. Now her research interests include Māori mental health and equity, improving service delivery for people experiencing severe mental illness, and early psychosis. She's a principal investigator on a study evaluating a peer-led acute service for severe mental illness 
and she also takes a lead role in a major HRC-funded grant, uh, a project investigating pathways to first episode psychosis and outcomes for Māori rangatahi. Uh, Jenny is also a trained therapist and involved in clinical trials for mood disorders. Kia ora, Laura Lee. So my job tonight is to talk about the role of parenting in building mental well-being in youth and adolescents. And I said to my daughters a few nights ago that I was going to do a talk on parenting, and my other, who's my best work, she said, oh, you're going to be really good at that, Mum. And I said, oh, thanks, sweetie. And then my um, middle child said to me, I think you need to keep practising parenting before you start teaching people about it. <laughs> So anyway, I think that makes me perfectly qualified to talk tonight about imperfect parenting. So we know that um, adolescents and teens that feel attached and connected to parents or their whānau have a better ability to regulate their emotions and have a healthier development of their identity. Um, and but attachment parenting really needs to be tailored to their age and their developmental needs. So I just want to briefly mention two things in regards to that. So first of all, adolescents and teens are going through this huge shift in terms of their identity development. And, and what we more commonly probably call in adult um, in terms is the sense of self. So sense of self is how we feel about ourselves. It's how we perceive ourselves in relation to others in the world. It's how we think others perceive us. It's also about our, our self-image and our ideal self. So who do we want to be in the future? Um, and there's also some major stuff going on in terms of their brain development, and I don't have time to talk about that tonight, but I think in really simple terms, what it means is they're emotional thinkers. And because they're emotional thinkers, um, that means that they still need their input and guidance from us, um, even though they, they, they're acting like And um, So I'll touch on those things a little bit as I go through. Attachment parenting or attachment theory has got a really strong evidence base, but it's largely been um, developed in Western sciences. So I think it's just worth me noting that when you hear, the, hear this ev evidence, you need to adapt it to your own values, your own beliefs, your own culture, and also your natural parenting instincts and bringing yourself as a natural parent to that relationship. Okay, so... The aim is to create a sense of safety for the adolescents or teen. Um, that's the role of the parent, not to be a therapist or a health professional, but to, to, to um, create a sense of safety. And there's two essential ingredients that adolescents and teens need to get that sense of safety. The first is being emotionally responsive towards them, and then the other is to have boundaries. And we need to, I want you to imagine these are like scales, so that we need to balance these two things. Um, now, if we're getting that right, um, then the outcome should be that they feel connected to us. And we know that being, them being connected to us means they're better able to regulate their emotions. If we're doing it in an age-appropriate way, um, then we're fostering a sense of autonomy, which is a really important part of that brain development they're going through, so giving them the opportunity to make decisions and make mistakes. So I'll come back to this in, in, in practical, practical terms about what this might look like. But first of all, I just want to talk about what happens when we tip the balance one way or the other. Um, so in this, what's commonly called as the jellyfish parenting style, is when we go really heavy on the emotional responsiveness side to the point that we placate their emotions or that we start to problem solve for them. And then we might go light on boundaries or hands off boundaries. Now, this is a dynamic that I used to see a little bit in um, teen adolescence mental health. So a teenager that's really suffering from some nasty depression or anxiety or having a really difficult time. Now, the context of that is really multifaceted. There's lots of different reasons why that might be occurring. But what often happened would be that the parents would respond in a way that they would be distressed for their teen. And what they would do is they have a tend to want to placate their emotions or to problem solve for them. But then the adolescent or the teen therefore doesn't really get the opportunity to learn how to regulate their own emotions. There's no sort of responsibility for them to do anything different. So it kind of, the, this regulation tends to remain. The t parent might respond with, again, doing more problem solving, but after a while when there's no shift in the dynamic, there's fatigue. And it can actually even lead to sort of parental or child resentment and anger. And what you get is more often is polarisation, which is the opposite to what we want, which is connection. So, so um, this, this type of parenting 
even when our mental, even when our teens aren't feeling well, isn't isn't quite the way to um, address it. So what happens when we flip the switch the other way? So this is when we lack the emotional responsiveness and warmth, and then we go heavy on with an emphasis on rules and control and consequences. Some of the negative side effects of this type of parenting um, are that it can lead to adolescents and teens um, doing what we call internalising emotions more, which means suppressing their emotions. They're not learning what the emotions are or processing them, they're just trying to hide them down. Um, and that can actually cause issues, especially later on in life, in terms of relationships about not knowing how to express emotion properly. It can also cause, um, often with this style of parenting, can come sometimes like an implicit or explicit um, um, degree of criticism about you can't make these decisions on your own or you're getting this wrong and you're, it's sort of more of a punishing style of responding. And actually, when we think about them having this developing sense of identity about who they are, they can take on some of that negative messaging in terms of the identity that they're developing. And I guess the third major side effect of this um, parenting would be that um, we, their brains are developing in a way that they are learning to, to problem solve and make decisions. But we're not going to, in this style of parenting, they're less likely to get that opportunity. And so when it does come time for them to need to make decisions and be autonomous, they, have, they lack the confidence because they haven't really had the exposure of being able to do it in a safe way. So what we're really aiming for is what's commonly called as authority or backbone parenting. It's so, so combining the two so they balance each other, and that's what creates the sense of security. Um, so, so an emotional responsiveness, of helping them de-escalate their emotions, validating their emotions is a really useful tool, and also just showing interest, um, and showing interest and having spending time with them so they feel connected to you. Um, but when we are delivering boundaries for adolescents and teens, we need to also do it with negotiables so they have that sense of developing autonomy. So let's say, for example, your teen, you've caught them, they've, they've, you found out they're vaping. Um, and how, so how might this apply? Um, you think, how am I going to be emotionally responsive to my teen when they've done this thing that's you know, not quite right? Try and take it from the perspective. Try and think about what it was like for them um, and what might have been the context to which the vaping occurred. I mean, I would probably say something naturally like, I remember when I was a teen how hard it would be to say no to my mates. So starting the conversation in an emotionally responsive way helps de-escalate their emotions and it also means that they're probably better prepared to hear the information that might help them make better decisions. The boundaries is a wee bit tricky in this sense because you can't lock down their lungs. You can't lock them down, or you might give it a go. Um, but, but you can't really do that. And so the boundary is more about um, talking about how it's not a safe thing to do and asking them, you know, how might you manage this differently if you were with your friends again? How might you be able to be in a better position to say no if this occurred again? So, uh, but I, uh, the thing about this is that this is kind of the general gist. This is what we want to do. But the reality is, is our to parent in this way um, is dependent on a number of things. Our capacity to do this is dependent on a number of things. For example, the type of attachment parenting we got. I know in the 80s when I w was being parented, I don't think emotional responsiveness was really part of my parents' dialogue. <laughs> they did a great job, you know. But, um, yeah, I don't think it was part of their dialogue. So it's not something that comes naturally to me. And I think the other thing is, what about all the stresses that are going on in our lives? You know, if I'm incredibly stressed at work or I've got heaps going on, I have a tendency to go home and go down hard on the boundaries and go more authoritarian with the kids. Um, 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 I guess as a therapist, occasionally I had the, I have the odd thought that one day one of my kids might even be talking to a therapist about me. <laughs> Katie Pye, they can have their corridor with their therapist. <laughs> It's actually, it's, actually, it's actually, there's some good news, is that what we're aiming for is being a good enough parent, doing this stuff some of the time, because when we actually stuff it up, we're actually providing them opportunity to learn about actually what the natural conditions are of human relationships. And that is the messiness of human behavior that we bring to the table. And so we're not aiming to do this perfectly every time. We're just try, trying to do our best. Um, and, and actually what there's, that's why there's a bit of a catchphrase that comes with this, is that that is why imperfect parenting is actually perfect parenting. Okay, kia ora everybody.
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jenny. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left for uh, a Q&A session now. Um, now, I'm sure some of you have got some questions for uh, our panel. Anyone uh, want to go? Anyone want to go first? Um, my daughter went and bought a pair of glasses, and they said they were blue blocking glasses, but they weren't orange, and they said blue blue light blocking. Would that be real, or like, do they have to be orange to work? Um, <laughs> I mean, it, there's no um, standard, you know, that set that people have to be tested, the glasses have to be tested by. Um, if you, so the ones I've got are particularly unfashionable looking, but they are genuinely blue blocking, and they do have to have some wrap around function, otherwise light gets in the side. And yeah, these just look like, um, they were quite trendy looking, but they said blue light blocking glasses, and so they were clear in color, and I just laughed right. and said, yeah, that's a joke, but she bought them anyway. <laughs> And she wears them sometimes, and I'm thinking, is that bad for her eyes? Do they are they not real? Like, I think many glasses probably block some of the blue light, but to get a really good effect, it should be ones that genuinely block out the entire blue light spectrum. And then I sh perhaps should have said, wearing them from six or seven at night till bedtime is the is the, the best time. Akira. Um, I had a question with regard to vaping. If it's been around, I think you said, since 1963 um, in New Zealand or in general, um, is there any data from that or is it an entirely different product now? Uh, the, the data on long-term use, I mean, although that was invented way back there, um, it didn't come into widespread use anywhere in the world until... I think the um, just before 2010. So, and even even then, we've got very limited data until about 2015. You saw where the first data we had in New Zealand, because people didn't even know to ask about it in 2015. And so, th there there is no long-term data. We've had smoking since Walter Raleigh. I think it was Walter Raleigh. <laughs> um, and we've had Sir Richard Doll's uh, studies in doctors in the 1950s. So what is that? That's uh, 70 years to study the effects of smoking. We've had probably five to seven years to study the long-term effects of vaping. And even then, it's been, a, it's been an uptake during that time. So, so we just don't have, the, we don't have data, even though it was a long time in coming. What we have, I should say, is um, animal experimental data and tissue data, so tissue exposure. So that's the, the level of experimental data at the moment. And some uh, surveys like have been done in Korea, which have uh, asked students to report on symptoms and seem to have found relationships. But studies on tissues do show in many cases, similar inflammatory effects to exposure to smoke, tobacco smoke, and studies in animals have shown um, similar but um, not quite as great effects as tobacco smoke, but on the same kind of, of, of effects. Kia ora, um, I have another sleep um, question. What's your thoughts about um, teenagers napping during the day and the impact that might have on sleeping at night? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, it, it is fairly clear that if, if you sleep for more than 20 minutes or so in the daytime, that is likely to have an effect of, on sleep at night. There's also a lot of very good data for the beneficial effects of short naps during the day. And my boss in Newcastle always used to say 17 and a half minutes, that's <coughs> the maximum you should sleep. I think it's difficult to be that exact, but you're not, not longer than half an hour uh, in general. Uh, this is another question on vaping. Um, just in regards to the research you've been doing with the uh, school children, 
I was just wondering how prevalent is uh, vaping on social media? Because you don't see advertising. You, I haven't seen movies yet. Like, you know, you used to see people smoking movies. I haven't seen that. So is that really prevalent? Have you done any research? Because I myself haven't seen, but then again, my interest is probably different from the interest of my child. So I was just wondering if it pops up a lot and if that's how they target the younger um, kids. Yeah. Yeah. It is prevalent on social media, but it probably targets um, certain profiles, I suspect. Um, I don't use social media myself, so I don't, I don't know, to be honest. But, um, but I know um, there are a lot of research studies about the social media advertising of vaping, and it is heavily advertised on social media, yes. Hi, I've just got a sleep question. Um, I was wondering what your view on the melatonin, taking melatonin supplements is, either for adults or teenagers. Thanks for that. I mean, the first thing to note is that it's not subsidised in, in New Zealand as a prescription medication, except for uh, children under the age of 18 with autistic spectrum disorder. Um, and I can see why that is, because many people might find melatonin to be helpful in various circumstances and I certainly find it incredibly helpful in jet, jet lag um, and I think there are a lot of people who might find that taking exogenous melatonin actually does improve their circadian rhythm and their sleep um, you can of course buy it on the internet um, but the, the amount of melatonin may not um, correspond to the amount of melatonin in the pharmaceutical that you can be prescribed potentially in, the UK, in, in New Zealand. So I personally find it very useful, um, but it's, it's problematic to prescribe it because it's so it's, it's expensive and the, the products you can buy, we don't know for sure how much melatonin is in them. Uh, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up there, but look, the, um, the experts, the professors, associate professor, doctors, uh, they will be here for a little bit afterwards if you've got a question you'd rather ask, uh, but not in front of any, everybody, perhaps. Um, um, I'd just like to um, leave by letting you know, now this talk's been recorded, as you will have noticed. Um, this is our third talk. It will be up on our website, our campus website, University of Otago, Christchurch, in about a week or so's time. Uh, along with the other two are up there already and the last talk to come. So if anyone hasn't been able to come and they'd like to, uh, to listen in, um, try logging on in about a week's time. Um, I'm going to finish with another saying. Mai te kōpai tiki uropa tato ako toni ai. From the cradle to the grave, we're forever learning. And I think as parents, no more so. Every day is different. We are learning new things about our children and teens. Some of them Lovely surprises, others not so much. Um, but we're all in this journey together. And um, I think, um, you know, Dame Fina Cooper had a wonderful saying, um, take care of our children, take care of what they hear, take care of what they see, take care of what they feel. For how the children grow, so too will be the shape of Aotearoa. And so will be the shape of your own families. And so I hope you've heard some good advice um, this evening. Go well, go safely. Thank you very much, everybody.